Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Municipalities of Saskatchewan Candidate School for Northern Municipalities. I want to thank everyone for attending today, and it's great to have you. We're going to start today's presentation by asking you to fill out the following poll. Uh, to do so, it's just going to pop up on your screen and just take a couple minutes to answer it if you could. And just give it a second. It's just uh, loading. There we go. And once you're done answering this poll, you can hit submit at the bottom of the poll and then we will move on. Uh, while we're doing that, I'll introduce myself. Hello, my name is Sean Whiskar. I'm one of municipalities of Saskatchewan's advocacy advisors. And I'll now give you a tour of our presentation page. Municipalities of Saskatchewan uses the program called Zoom. You can see that there's icons at the bottom of your screen. You have your audio settings at the bottom left of your screen. And if you're having any problems with audio on your computer, you can always switch to phone audio. You have the Q&A button for questions. Please note that you have the choice to send your questions anonymously and that the questions can only be viewed by us, the panelists. We have the chat for the comments and conversation. You can send your comments to just the panelists or to the panelists and all attendees. Uh, and I see some of you have already been in the, uh, the message board today talking to us. We also have the raise hand function, which will be used by us if we're having any technical difficulties or need any last minute feedback, or if you would like to ask your question in person. I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor Brownlee. Thanks to Brownlee sponsorship, we are able to offer this session to you for free. I'm now going to hand it over to Derek King from Brownlee to bring his greetings. Thanks, Sean. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. It's uh... It's a real pleasure to once again uh, sponsor the event and to uh, to be a participant on behalf of Brownlee. And so I'm carrying forward greetings on behalf of all the partners and associates in our Brownlee uh, Municipal Law Group. Um, I know that some of you will say, who is Brownlee? And uh, just to, in a short summary, we are a municipal law firm. It's what we do. We represent municipalities. Um, we have been doing so for close to 90 years now uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Nunavut, the Northwest Territories, and a little bit into the Yukon. Uh, we represent well over 380 municipalities in various capacities. Uh, myself, uh, I lead a couple areas in our group, including uh, co-leading our governance uh, practice group for municipalities, which is directly related to what we'll be discussing today. So uh, I come at this with about 22 years of experience. Uh, so, um, and, and I've seen a lot of issues arise for counselors and prospective counselors. So um, we really strongly support this kind of proactive education session. Um, for individuals who are thinking of becoming elected officials. Uh, I think you're going to find that the panel you have today will have some exceptionally valuable information for you and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say as well. Um, so I think uh, without further ado, uh, once again, welcome everybody. I hope you will find this as informative as I know I will. So thanks, Sean. Perfect. Thank you again, Derek. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, up first, we have Brad Henry. He's the Executive Director of Government Relations Northern Municipal Service Branch. He is headquartered in LaRange and his team supports Northern municipalities by providing grant funding, community planning, district municipal administration, and advisory services. We also have Hassan Akhtar, Manager, and Northern, Manager of Northern Municipal Administration, Northern Municipal Services uh, in LaRange and his team supports municipal administration of the district and advisory services to other northern municipalities. We also have Gerald Roy. He was born in the historic Métis community of Isle La Crosse and is a lifetime resident of Saskatchewan's north. He is serving his fourth term as a councillor for the northern village of Isle La Crosse. As part of Gerald's municipal council portfolios, he works closely with local re recreation and minor sports, the fire department, essential services, and chairs the Isle Cross, Isle Cross Communication Society Incorporated. He is also the Community Safety Board slash Healing on the Land Project, and Gerald currently serves as the Northern as the Northern Regional Director for Municipalities of Saskatchewan. So, without further ado, we're going to start off our presentation, and I'll hand it over to Hassan uh, to begin the slides. 
Oh, and Hassan, you're on mute, so I'll just uh, get you to unmute yourself. Uh, maybe it's Katie that has muted you. I'll get Katie to unmute you. Um, just hold on one second while we uh, figure out this technical difficulty. I apologize, everyone, folks. Um, Katie, can you try uh, unmuting him again? It's not working. Um, or has, yep, there we go. Okay. We can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. Okay, yeah. can everybody he hear me well? Hello? Okay. Uh, good morning, every everyone. And uh, this is uh, Hassan Akhtar. Today, uh, I'll talk about uh, matters related to being a candidate for election uh, to councils of uh, a very special uh, group of uh, type of municipalities, uh, northern municipalities. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, I'd like to begin with some uh, visual uh, re reference of the region where uh, northern municipalities are uh, located. Uh, uh, it's called Northern Saskatchewan Administration District or NSAD. Um, we have uh, 25 incorporated municipalities in the region, two towns, 11 uh, northern villages, 11 Northern Hamlets, and of course, uh, the, the district uh, that we, uh, the Northern Municipal uh, Services uh, administer. Um, also in the district, uh, uh, the Saskatchewan portion of uh, Plinthon, the city of Plinthon is, uh, is included, uh, but uh, the city is mostly in Manitoba. So uh, in the district, uh, we have 11 Northern settlements. Uh, 14 resort subdivisions and nine cluster divisions, and uh, uh, about 9,000 uh, isolated disp dispositions uh, that would be uh, cabins uh, uh, scattered all, all over. And uh, our um, Minister of Government Relations uh, acts as the council uh, for the district. Uh, uh, some authorities of the council. Uh, uh, I have been delegated uh, to my boss, uh, Brad Henry, our executive uh, director. Um, as uh, the district is also a northern municipality, uh, that means uh, we also run elections, and uh, those elections we run uh, in our uh, 11 northern settlements. So uh, uh, next slide, please, Sean. Um, the reason why... Uh, Northern municipalities, like other groups of municipalities in uh, Saskatchewan, exist. It's because uh, uh, of uh, uh, provision for good uh, government uh, in the north, uh, provide services uh, and infrastructure that residents uh, feel necessary and uh, desirable um, to make the, the northern uh, municipalities uh, sustainable and safe, and also to provide. Um, stewardship of uh, public assets. Now, in order to do that, uh, the legal framework comes from uh, Northern Municipalities uh, Act. And uh, uh, the municipalities uh, uh, are a level of government. So uh, they also, uh, they're also given na natural uh, personal powers and governmental powers under, under the act. Uh, natural person powers uh, means uh, that they are able to buy and sell uh, land assets, enter into contracts. Governmental power uh, entails uh, um, enforcing bylaws. The bylaws are laws of uh, municipalities, uh, impose taxes, fines, so and so forth. Um, yeah, next, next slide, please. So, uh, municipalities are, are at a level of government so and it's a democratic government at the local level the this means uh, the councils are elected by uh, open 
sector at Ballot. Um, and the municipal council governs uh, the community or the, the municipality through resolutions and bylaws. Resolutions are mostly used for regular administrative matters and bylaws are uh, used uh, for uh, other ma matters uh, uh, that affect uh, uh, the, uh, the lives of uh, uh, residents, uh, which would be like water and sewer rates by, by bylaws. Um, and the council uh, make, makes decisions collectively. This means that individual councillors uh, doesn't have any special power or authority. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, there, there's a mayor and mayor's uh, responsibility is to uh, preside over, over the me uh, meetings and uh, be like a face of uh, their municipality. Uh, now, the council is supported by their administrator. Uh, next slide, please. The administrator uh, ensures that uh, council's uh, policies are uh, ca carried out. Uh, policies uh, are uh, matters related to governance, and uh, uh, this entails like how uh, particular things would be done in, 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 in that municipality. Um, and administrator runs day-to-day -day operations, uh, provides uh, notice uh, and uh, does other uh, requirements that are mentioned in the Northern Municipalities Act. So in order to order for the administrators to do so, uh, they need a level of competency and uh, which, uh, which, be, which would be uh, a certification uh, from uh, a human. Uh, next, next slide, please. So now I'm moving into the 2020 general elections. Uh, as uh, uh, you can see, uh, uh, Northern municipalities are, are allowed four options uh, to hold their elections. The, uh, obviously, like all other municipalities in Saskatchewan, uh, the last date uh, or the main election date is uh, Monday, November 9th, but they can also uh, do uh, their elections uh, um, before that day, uh, which would be uh, um, September 23rd, second last Wednesday in September, September 30th, last Wednesday in September, and October 7th, uh, first Wednesday in October. And the term for office of the council members uh, are four years. For northern municipalities, the council members are elected at large. There's no provisions uh, for creating a uh, 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 ward or, or division. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here I'm going to talk about candidate uh, eligibility. Uh, uh, the candidates uh, uh, need to be 18 years of age or older, not disqualified pursuant to this means uh, uh, Northern Municipalities Act or any other act. Uh, they must be city, Canadian citizens, uh, resided uh, in Saskatchewan for um, at least six consecutive months immediately before the date uh, on which they filed their nomination. And uh, there's a similar residency requirement uh, in, their, uh, uh, in the municipality where they, uh, they're going to be running for office, and uh, that's uh, uh, at least for uh, three months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, disqualification uh, uh, from uh, uh, being uh, eligible as a, can a candidate. Uh, well, this uh, means that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, a judge of a court in Saskatchewan um, or auditors uh, or lawyer of a municipality uh, of the municipality cannot run for office as a council member. Other disqualification categories are if they lose eligibility, uh, uh, which would be like a, a missing uh, two meetings in three months, uh, if they uh, have uh, been found to uh, made, uh, have made false declaration in the uh, nomination form, um, they can convict it uh, or removed uh, from office uh, by our uh, minister. So under Northern Municipalities Act, uh, there's a uh, Section uh, section 14, and that gives broad power uh, to our ministers 
uh, uh, to uh, take uh, these measures uh, in exceptional circumstances. Um, if uh, a council member is disqualified, then uh, this, uh, the term of disqualification uh, is uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, if not, uh, uh, they got uh, earlier pardon. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, no, nomination. Now, the, the process of uh, nomination uh, begins uh, about um, seven weeks uh, from uh, the date of election. So five weeks uh, uh, before the date of election is the nomination date, which is the last date uh, on which uh, uh, candidates uh, need to file their nomination uh, uh, papers, uh, and uh, uh, they get uh, uh, 10 days, 10 working days uh, uh, um, to file the nom nomination up until the nomination day. And uh, uh, before the start of uh, these uh, 10 uh, business days, uh, municipalities uh, needs, needs to post uh, um, form H, notice of call for nominations in, in local newspaper or electronic uh, media, and then uh, the candidates and, uh, and need to uh, during this nomination uh, period up until nomination day, they need to uh, submit a field in uh, form uh, I, uh, with, uh, where they need uh, to get a, a, nomina a nomination from uh, five uh, voters in, in their respective uh, communities. And uh, at the back side of the form, they also uh, need to sign acceptance, uh, which uh, is required to, uh, to be witnessed by two um, witnesses, uh, the nominators uh, must be voters of the community, but the witnesses uh, can be any uh, adult person. Uh, and then uh, there's another form, uh, form K, uh, that uh, the municipalities need to give them as a receipt or acceptance of, uh, of the nomination. Now, um, uh, this completes the, the process of uh, filing a nomination. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with uh, the nomination form, uh, uh, the candidates uh, need to uh, submit a public disclosure uh, statement, uh, and uh, this uh, form or uh, document basically uh, uh, identifies their employment, uh, financial or business interest, the properties that uh, they themselves or their immediate family members uh, uh, own, uh, um, and in, uh, the definition of family member as, uh, as per the Northern Municipalities Act um, means that uh, uh, the candidates are wife and uh, dependent uh, children. Um, so uh, now that this is a requirement that they file this uh, public disclosure statement with their nomination paper, and uh, the, the, there's also a 30-day period uh, um, uh, to um, uh, include any uh, any, uh, any changes, uh, um, uh, thirty days. Uh, I mean, uh, after that, they, if they get elected, and this uh, document is a public document. It would be posted with a nomination of, uh, paper on the uh, municipalities and uh, notice board. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, the public disclosure statement that uh, I talked uh, in uh, talked about in uh, the earlier slide uh, is related to conflict of uh, interest. Conflict of interest is broadly defined in the in the Northern Municipalities Act. So uh, at high level, I would uh, say that uh, uh, if uh, there's uh, any motion under uh, uh, that is moved. Uh, in the council uh, uh, that affects, uh, adversely affects or uh, may have the potential, potential to benefit uh, the council uh, member or the immediate family members, they need to declare a uh, conflict. Um, and this is after uh, they get uh, elected. This is not uh, uh, something, uh, uh, you know, very relevant uh, uh, to filing nomination. Uh, so. Uh, when they declare a conflict of interest, they 
have to disclose the nature of the conflict, abstain from any dis uh, di discussion, uh, refrain from uh, influencing uh, any council member about, on anything related to that motion and leave the council chamber. And uh, the contraventions of a con conflict of uh, interest uh, uh, is handled under uh, the Code of Ethics uh, bylaw that now uh, that is now mandatory for each uh, northern municipalities to uh, pass. Uh, next slide, please. So this is about uh, the oath of uh, oath or affirmation of office. Once uh, the council uh, member gets elected, they have to sign an oath of office, and uh, this document entails that uh, they would uh, uh, the promising or uh, assuring that uh, they they, uh, they would work for, for the, the municipalities in good faith. Uh, they would not indulge in any bad practices, uh, perform their, their duties uh, diligently, will disclose uh, a conflict of interest, will comply with uh, the with code of ethics, uh, uh, rules of conduct, uh, and uh, comply with, with the Northern Municipal Provisions of the North, Northern Municipalities Act. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the, it's mandatory for the, uh, the northern each northern municipalities to pass code of ethics bylaw, and basically this slide uh, mentions what that entails. Uh, uh, the council uh, council members uh, need to uh, serve their communities with honesty, objectivity, respect uh, the fellow council members and uh, municipal staff. Uh, uh, they would ensure uh, transparency and accountability in their action. Uh, they would ensure con confidentiality. Now, uh, I would uh, like to touch uh, on uh, this uh, uh, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality pa part of uh, council members' duties. So, uh, uh, that, that's another, another act, the Local Go Government Freedom of Information and uh, Protection of Privacy Act, and the Part B of that act. Um, it spells out uh, what uh, uh, are the matters that uh, generally would fall under for confidentiality. And if there's a matter that, uh, that's confidential that uh, the council would like to discuss, uh, there's a provision in the Northern Municipalities Act for them to go in camera, which, which is a closed door station. Um, then council uh, pro provides uh, the leadership, uh, ensures that uh, there uh, ensures that the public interest uh, interest is represented in their decisions, and they act uh, res responsibility and uh, a good faith. Uh, council members are trustees of uh, public assets. So basically, the code of uh, ethics bylaw uh, is meant to ensure that uh, council members uh, 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 serve their um, uh, communities uh, in governance uh, part of, of uh, uh, the municipal uh, uh, process uh, uh, in good faith and uh, um, and objectively. N next slide, please. Here, uh, this is my uh, last slide. Uh, I, I have uh, listed some uh, unique challenges that uh, uh, northern municipalities uh, face. Uh, as I've uh, shown in my uh, second uh, slide, uh, the, the map uh, uh, shows that the large area, and it's a, it's a northern part of uh, north of the province that entails, includes 46% uh, uh, of the area. Uh, it's a huge area. So northern communities are uh, remote, and there's a high cost of living, high uh, cost of maintaining and operating uh, um, or constructing uh, infrastructure. Uh, many northern communities uh, have a very small population, so uh, there's some weakness uh, in governance and, uh, and administering their communities. Um, they face uh, challenges in accountability and transparency, meaning that uh, 
uh, some um, northern uh, communities uh, fall behind in uh, submitting uh, their audit report or uh, 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 other uh, uh, legislative uh, requirements that uh, they are required to do. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Northern Municipal Trust Account, as well as our pa partner, uh, New North, uh, they are uh, uh, working on uh, programs uh, to address those uh, uh, weakness and uh, um, ho hopefully in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the next uh, near future, uh, uh, many of these deficiencies uh, will be successfully addressed. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, that, that's, uh, this, uh, this is my uh, last slide, uh, slide uh, and uh, I'm uh, now free to uh, take questions. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, I, I need to refer uh, to my uh, staff or uh, refer to uh, documents, so then uh, I'll uh, um, get back to uh, the, um, uh, the audience uh, uh, later on. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Hassan. That was a really engaging and uh, interesting presentation, and uh, I certainly learned a lot. So I know our uh, our audience certainly, hopefully, did as well. Uh, I'll just hand it over to Brad and ask if there's anything you would like to add or uh, build upon from this presentation before we move on. Hi. Um, well, to be honest, I think Hassan covered, um, you know, really all of the important points. Um, he, the uh, general election dates are um, are the, um, uh, the the critical point, and um, that's um, uh, yeah, exactly. If you could pull up that slide, thank you. Um, ultimately, I think you know, in the context of this um, meeting, it's important just to reflect on. Um, some of the other points that Hassan made about the, you know, ultimately the roles and powers of, of a council. Um, and I think it does reflect on some of the questions that have um, been posed so far. So maybe I'll just uh, touch on some of that and hopefully try and answer some of the uh, first couple of questions um, in, at the same time. You know, ultimately the, the main job of a, a municipal council is to provide leadership and to make policy. Um, members are elected for council, as Hassan said, um, to represent the entire community, not just any particular group of interests or uh, group of residents or anything like that, um, but ultimately what's best um, for the uh, community at large. Um, so collectively, council make, members make dis, uh, decisions about what ultimately what a municipality does. Um, municipalities primarily provide services to residents, and that's a lot of what councillors talk about is what uh, and, and make decisions about is um, providing those services to residents, um, how those services would be provided, what levels of service are needed, those sorts of questions. You know, ultimately, it's um, there's no question that um, it's necessary to rely on the support, advice, and assistance of um, your administrator and municipal administration during that process, because at the end of the day, once the decision is made by council, it's the administration that's responsible for implementing those policies and those decisions. Um, you know, so I guess to just to reflect on, um, you know, that first question, once a mayor has been elected, can the administrator be released to make way for a new team? Um, ultimately, those two things are completely independent. Um, if an administrator is, um, uh, you know, um, meeting the needs of the community and um, uh, following the directions effectively of the, um, of the council, then it's absolutely um, um, then everything's fine. If that's not happening, then it's absolutely council's responsibility to ensure that they're providing for effective and continuous administration. So ultimately, regardless of um, um, you know an election or anything like that, if um, the, the council's there to make sure that that um, those services are being provided the right way, and if that's not happening, to make the decisions that they need to, including um, you know the um, administration, the um, that said, though, it's, um, it's not uh, the role of uh, the mayor or any particular councillor. Uh, at the end of the day, the council works together to implement these and make these decisions. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the, the critical points. 
Um, I guess just with respect to the second question, um, we can go into this in a little more detail maybe later, but I just wanted to state that um, ultimately with respect to municipal corporations, um, there's a lot of considerations and it's certainly not a black and white um, answer. It's really context dependent, right? Because it could very well potentially range into situations about conflict of interest as Hassan had mentioned earlier, which are ultimately, you know, um, contextual and taken on a case by case basis. Um, you know, at, at a high level, it's absolutely appropriate for a member of council, including the mayor, to, as a representative of the municipality, sit on a board of directors of a controlled corporation. It, it, I would say they should, they, they ought to. It's their responsibility to lead that corporation as much as it is to lead the municipality. If the municipality owns or controls more than 50% of that corporation, the, the one of the councillors should absolutely be, be responsible for working uh, as a member of that. Uh, board of directors. Now the difference is is uh, a governance function like on a board of directors or a chairman of a board of directors as opposed to collecting a paycheck. Um, that's again a case-by-case -case situation and can be um, um, uh, you know colored by a lot of different things and so you know ultimately the truth is in the details with respect to these things and I, I don't think you're going to get a direct answer to that question here. Um, the, the eligibility factor would depend on you know like I said whether they're employed or not. Um, I think that's about it for me. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Brad. And uh, we'll, we'll circle back to see if Derek has any thoughts around the Q&A. Um, but first, I want to hand it over to Gerald. So, uh, Gerald, as a municipal councillor and everything you hear today, I was just wondering if you could touch on uh, what are some of the essential things you wish you would have known before you started your journey as becoming a councillor? And uh, kind of what are some of the most crucial lessons that you've taken from your time uh, being a counselor in a la Crosse. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, I, I, my my uh, journey with the municipal council started back in 1994. Um, I, ser I served two terms back then. I was actually the youngest person elected into a municipal council back then. And uh, at that point in time, I was actually working with the, uh, the youth in Isle of La Crosse. Just came out of university, so I thought, I'll see how this goes. So they, they actually encouraged me to run for a municipal council and I eventually got in. Um, I guess uh, I, I went in obviously green to what municipal councils and what mayor and council do uh, for the municipality. So it was a very, very quick and steep learning curve for me. And uh, we did reach out to our uh, Northern municipal advisor at the time, which was Bruce Lear. Uh, who came in and provided us with some uh, some guidance and direction. Me specifically, uh, uh, I think I was one of two that were new on the council that year. So I served from 94 to 2000. Um, I just thought, what am I getting myself into? And what authority and responsibility do I have as an elected member uh, governing the municipality by all across? The first thing I really, really wanted to uh, get an understanding of was the Northern Municipalities Act. And uh, how does my role and responsibility as an elected member uh, tie in closely to that? And um, what limitations do I have? And where can I go? What can I do? What can I not do? So I thought it would be important for me to, uh, to have the very clear understanding of uh, what my roles and responsibilities were. Um, I think it's important if, uh, if we have any young people uh, joining us today to maybe do a little bit of research on the Northern Municipalities Act and uh, what your roles and responsibilities may be. Uh, if you have a certain interest in whatever that is in, a, in the community, be it health and safety, uh, finances, budgeting, um, dealing with bylaws, uh, dealing with the public, uh, interacting, engaging uh, uh, people in the community, whatever it might be, uh, I would encourage uh, individuals to uh, to do their research and be prepared to do a lot of um, good work for your community uh, in partnership with mayor and council, um, the administrators and staff, and most importantly with community members. Uh, you're not, so to speak, taking on major roles, but you're, you're leading some files and I think it's important that uh, you're engaging the uh, community members when uh, you're dealing with uh, certain files, whatever it might be, recreation, uh, infrastructure, um, essential services, so on and so forth. Um, 
I think one will quickly learn as you go on in the municipal council that uh, you tend to uh, lean towards some projects that really captures your attention and this is what you want to dedicate your, uh, dedicate your time to. It's important, but it's also important to know how far you can go and how far you can take that uh, because you don't want to get involved with the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality. So it's really important that uh, you take a really close look at the, what you can and cannot do. Um, the conflict of interest stuff, uh, I, I learned that very quickly. Uh, I had to step down from uh, numerous boards where I noticed I would have been in a conflict. Um, and then I volunteered from when I was, I think, 14 years old. And I think that kind of prepped me to uh, get into uh, some of the roles and responsibilities that I now find myself in. And uh, I've been appointed provincially, of course, to many uh, boards and committees. So that's also helped me. So get involved with your community. Uh, understand what your community needs are. Understand what the challenges are. Uh, understand what the issues are. And work with all um, groups and agencies and uh, get a really good understanding of uh, um, what um, those needs are of uh, your community members and whatnot. So um, I think another very important one here, um, folks, I think people uh, would agree with me, <clears throat> getting an understanding of how taxes work the taxation system, people ask questions. Most of the time it's about taxation. And if you're a rate payer in a community, you want to have an understanding of, again, doing a little bit of research and maybe reaching out to Saskatchewan Assessment Management Association, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, help you with that. Um, in 2012, when I decided to run again, I was in 94 to 2000, and 2012, again, I came back on, I was reelected. My first task was to try to educate the community and the ratepayers as to how the taxation system works. So I did try to bring in somebody from SAMA. They wouldn't do it a public presentation type thing, but they wanted to do one one on one. What I noticed from that is we had two of the probably richest individuals in the community actually meet at the SAMA rep and nobody else. I don't know why they won't do a public forum or a public presentation. If not, then I actually I asked them to use one of our municipal development corporations, which is Isle Cross Communication Society, Inc. It's cable, internet, and radio station. We can do that over uh, local cable and present it over also the radio. They wouldn't do it. Anyway, get a good understanding of how the taxation system works. It's really important because a lot of questions come from that and the more prepared you are, the better you'll be able to answer them. And you would tend to those fires when it comes to taxes and uh, questions around that. So um, uh, proper fiscal responsibility was another one. I uh, had very little knowledge around uh, budgeting and reading financial statements and whatnot. If you could get an understanding of the basics on that, you're set. Uh, get a little bit of an uh, understanding around fiscal management and uh, uh, anything that has to do with finance is really, really important. Code of ethics, of course, um, you want to do, you want to look also into that a little closely. Again, the, the words that uh, Hassan has uh, uh, mentioned in his, in his uh, presentation around respect, trust, honesty, accountability, transparency, confidentiality, and responsibility. Those are probably um, the top ones I would uh, consider. And when, you oppose a motion or a project or whatever it might be. I don't take it personal. <clears throat> I learned very quickly that you have to respect the decision of the majority. In this case, if you're the only one that's opposing a certain uh, motion or whatever it might be, don't leave the ch council chambers that day and go and uh, voice your concern or your opinion with others. Show the respect of the rest of the council when they make a decision. It's, it, it makes everything run so much smoother. And um, knowing how uh, proper parliamentary procedures work, I think that's another very, very important one. And uh, I mean, we take the time in Isle of Cross where actually back in the 90s to 2000, I started what was called the Junior Mayor and Council. It's still in existence today. It's, it's changed a little bit. Now we're using the, uh, the uh, uh, 
the uh, SRC through our high school, the uh, Student Representative Council. So the president there automatically becomes uh, the junior mayor and uh, the rest of the uh, on the Student Representative Council become uh, junior council. So we actually help them in building some capacity. We include them on boards and committees in the community. They don't have voting privileges if they're under 18, of course. And uh, one of them actually sits, the, the president or the junior mayor actually sits on our Isle of Cross Communications Society Inc. Um, she does presentations and she uh, speaks at her public events and uh, uh, engagements and, and whatnot. So a very uh, good way of building capacity for young people to get involved in municipal politics. And uh, I think also from that shaping and molding our young people, uh, I've been fortunate, Iowa Cross has been fortunate to have some really, really outstanding, committed, hardworking, uh, responsible, transparent, accountable uh, administrators. Rose Dion, the late Rose Dion was a mentor of mine and a mentor of a lot of people, including our uh, current uh, administrator, Diane McCallum. Diane is now uh, be retiring after the next election and uh, a former uh, young person by the name of Donnie Fable is now taking up the administrative role. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's certified. And we have one additional young person in our office who is now uh, working on her LGA, which is Kathleen Nispina. So I think we're good for the next 25, 30 years and our community continues to grow. I like to say that the community is uh, progressive and productive. We have two municipal development, well, actually three municipal development corporations. One's a not-for-profit, one's for-profit, and I've mentioned ICSI on several occasions, which is a for-profit and not-for-profit arm. So generating wealth, building capacity, forming partnerships, and uh, just looking out for the best interests of your community and making sure you have that uh, in the back of your mind and uh, on, a, on in your heart at all times when you're making decisions for the community. Um, I would talk about bylaws and all that, but just familiarize yourself with as much as possible. And, uh, and then as time goes on, you learn more and you become more comfortable with your position and uh, uh, the needs and uh, responsibilities that come with that. I think that's all I have for now, Sean, and uh, I'll certainly uh, uh, answer any questions if there's any for me. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gerald. That was, uh, that was a lot of information and uh, I think it was all really helpful. And I think being able to bring in that real world experience of, of being a counselor in the North is definitely going to be beneficial for uh, our potential candidates here as they look at running for election. Uh, last but not least, before we jump into the Q&A, uh, I'll just hand it over to Derek if you have any final thoughts uh, that you want to share or anything that uh, you can share from your legal perspective coming out of this presentation. Uh, and then we'll move into the questions. Uh, thanks, Sean. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think Gerald really covered pretty much everything I would provide from the, you know, from a common sense perspective. Uh, you know, um, maybe what I would comment on just to, to build on a little bit of what he said is, uh, I think, uh, really just to underline the importance of understanding what it is that you are involving yourself in. Um, you know, it's, it's an important, uh, important role. I mean, local government is, in my opinion, the most important level of government we have in this country because it is the level that it, we interact with every day. And so your elected officials are, are a very important position to be in. And it's not something to... Uh, to jump into lightly, uh, it's a very important public service. But you are, you are still performing a public service, and you need to to go in there with an understanding of what that entails. Um, just to reiterate what Gerald was saying, you know, uh, it is worth going in and getting a general sense of the obligations that are imposed on councillors, um, the duties and responsibilities, how decision making occurs, understanding that councillors in their individual capacity don't have any particular authority to bind the municipality or to make decisions, uh, you know, council acts as a whole. And, uh, you know, that's an important thing for especially new councillors to understand because we do see that that is an area where issues can, can arise, where issues with the code of conduct, for example, can arise, where a councillor, you know, through nothing but good intention, uh, gets themselves a, a, a head of council or, or puts himself into a position, frankly, of, of doing something that administration should be doing rather than an elected official. So it's important to understand the role of elected officials individually and collectively to understand where the dividing line is between the responsibilities of council and the responsibilities of administration, what's policy versus what's operations, 
and to go from there. Um, you know, I, and I think that's all I would really reiterate. It's just the importance of, of, of getting an understanding of what it is that the role that you will be applying for by virtue of putting your name forward to the public uh, requires of you to ensure that you uh, hit the ground running and uh, don't spend your time bogged down with trying to figure out um, where the safe path is. You know, when, so that's the important thing I think there. Um, there's a few, I have a few comments on some of the uh, questions that have been posed, but we can leave that to the Q&A. So, thanks. Perfect. And, uh, and with that, we will jump right into the Q&A. So um, Brad already kind of got us kicked off early, but uh, we'll start anyway. Uh, the first question, which Brad already talked on, is once a mayor has been elected, can the administrator be released to make way for a new team? Uh, does anyone have additional thoughts that they'd like to share uh, beyond uh, what Brad has already touched on? Yeah, I, I want to add, uh, this is Hassan, by the way, that ad, administrator and uh, the, any other uh, municipal em, employees, uh, they, they are employees. So their uh, employment is uh, governed by Employment Standards Act. Uh, when a new councillor takes over, uh, they cannot just uh, be let let go. You know, there, uh, there has to be a process. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, depending if there's uh, some irregularities uh, uh, that were discovered by the new council, so the, that has to be dealt with a, a proper a, a process uh, uh, under the law. Other than that, uh, administrators uh, or administration staff, their employees, they're going to stay and uh, uh, every four years there would be municipal elections and uh, uh, there would be a new, new council. Uh, uh, that's all I have to add. Um, I guess just, um, just to touch on that answer again, uh, or that question again, um, you know, as Hassan mentioned, um, you know, hiring and firing can't just be something willy-nilly um, because, you know, ultimately you're putting the, the municipality in a, a situation that they may be legally liable for your actions, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, the important thing, again, is to just to consider and reflect on what the best interest of the community is at large. Um, a lot of times these sorts of questions are focused around a particular issue, and um, I guess that's just what I want to caution against is that uh, a counselor's role isn't uh, to hyper-focus on an issue um, to potentially the detriment of everything else. Uh, the counselor's role is to think about the whole system at large, make decisions in that greater context. Um, it might seem in the context of an issue that getting rid of the administrator on day one is in the best interest of the community, but I can guarantee you that unless there's another administrator waiting in the wings to jump in, you're doing your community a disservice because continuity of administration is absolutely critical. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, sorry, uh, Sean, just one quick thing on top of that. I think everybody else has covered off most of this, but I just will, just to underline what was stated, um, from our, our municipal labor and employment team's perspective, one of the biggest drivers of legal costs for communities on the labor and employment side is uh, improper termination of, of the administrator, uh, not following the process, doing it too quickly. Um, you know, so it, it is an area that can uh, really drive up your legal costs which drives up taxes. So it's something to, to bear in mind that if you're going to go down that road, exercise caution and follow the process exactly. And if you have difficulty with the process, get that legal counsel early. It's a lot cheaper to get the advice up front than to try to unravel it once, uh, once the horse is out of the barn. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, We'll move on to the next one and then I'll, we'll just quickly touch on it. And I guess I'll ask if uh, Hassan or Derek, if you have anything to add around um, whether uh, the municipal corporation renders someone ineligible to continue to hold that position uh, for the second question. But uh, I think Brad has kind of largely touched on that around uh, municipal controlled corporations. Yeah, uh, what I, I think, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go, go ahead. Yeah, like as per uh, the Northern Municipalities Act, if uh, the president uh, is a, a paid employee of uh, of the corporation, uh, then uh, that person is, uh, in, is ineligible to uh, uh, hold office as a council member. Otherwise, as uh, Brad has uh, mentioned, uh, municipal uh, development corporations are uh, 
uh, owned by the municipalities and uh, uh, the uh, councillors uh, sit on the board of those cor corporations uh, to repres uh, represent the interest of the owners. The councillors are not uh, shareholders of that corporation. So they just uh, make sure that the interest of the owner municipality is protected. Uh, that's all. Yeah, I think that covers it. So. Perfect. Uh, our next question is, how does a counselor handle a contravention with ethics when it is about a fellow counselor or counselors as a whole, including the administrator? Uh, what direction can they go and who should they contact? Uh, uh, this is Hassan again. So if uh, a, a contravention of the code of ethics uh, is uh, no noted, uh, obviously, that, that has to be discussed by, by the council, uh, prefer, preferably uh, in an in-camera uh, session. And uh, depending on the, the nature of uh, the irregularities uh, or contravention, uh, uh, sometimes the uh, law enforcement uh, uh, agencies uh, could be involved, uh, um, and uh, audit could be called for. Uh, depends. Uh, that's all from me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have some thoughts on this, but I don't want to step over uh, any elected official who might have some thoughts on this because I think that's the advice we really need to hear. Because I made me that a Gerald. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking at Gerald as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Gerald, I think you're on mute. You're trying to answer. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I had, I I was distracted by a, a, a an email I got. A very sorry, the, the question is: How does a counselor handle a contravention with ethics when it's about a fellow counselor or counselors as a whole, including the administrator? What direction should you go, and who should you contact? Well, first of all, I, I always I, I I approach it carefully, and then is it within the best interest of the community. Um, if my, my council, my mayor and council are, are very open and then we usually discuss and debate the situation. If, uh, if it's not budgeted, obviously, uh, there's a lot of discussion around that. Uh, if it's going to impact, uh, or if the person's in a, in a position of conflict, they should clearly understand that. Uh, and is it for the, within the best interest of the community? That's how I look at it. Um, we get uh, a lot of legal advice when it comes down to um, decisions where mayor and council are very unsure of their position or of um, uh, a project or uh, an issue or a matter that's before us. Of course, we turn back to uh, North Municipal Services for some advice, uh, but we tend to turn to uh, our legal counsel for uh, some of the uh, matters that are we think that are uh, are beyond our decision-making process and make sure that we're within line and we're not con uh, contravening the Northern Municipalities Act and other areas. So um, again, I think it's important for uh, councillors, mayor and council to have a really, really good understanding of the roles and responsibilities and where they can go and what can they do and cannot do. Um, I think that's very important. But uh, if you're unsure, uh, discuss it, debate it. And then uh, you can, as an individual counselor, you can make the motion to, to maybe table or postpone uh, um, the uh, motion to, for further review and uh, let your administrators uh, do some work and uh, do some research on it and bring it back. Better to be safe than sorry, so. Yeah, uh, I, I really don't have much to add other than what, um, you know, supporting everything that Gerald and, and Hassan have already said, you know, ultimately um, the actions kind of scale with um, um, the, the seriousness, right? First and foremost, um, the important thing is to raise it with the council directly. Um, informally is, is almost always best um, with respect to these sorts of things. Um, as, as Hassan had said, that uh, can often happen in a confidential way in an in-camera session. Doesn't have to be on public record. That said, though, um, if that if your concern hasn't been addressed in um, that informal way, you absolutely, as a counselor, have every right to um, raise the concern formally at the table and and make council make a resolution on that and have it recorded in the minutes. Um, 
the um, that forces council to make um, a recorded um, position with respect to that matter and your and the information you brought to bear. And um, a lot of times that can um, uh, you know change things for the better. That said, um, if it's still the case that um, this hasn't been effectively addressed from your perspective, um, you can always lodge a formal complaint under the Code of Ethics bylaw of the municipality. Um, a next step I would say would be to try and contact the um, Ombudsman Saskatchewan. They have a responsibility for investigating and making recommendations to municipalities on matters of local concern, this being one of those. Um, last but not least, um, the issue could be taken before a judge and have a judge make a formal determination. Perfect. Um, thank you. And Derek, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think that kind of covers it. I was going to just comment uh, that the Code of Ethics itself uh, typically will provide for both a formal and, and informal complaint process where it can get particularly sticky is when it deals with pretty much everybody else on council and administration and when you get to that point you have a pretty serious issue potentially and that's where typically our clients will, uh, will get well as you'll see the ombudsman involved or uh, even the minister uh, and the you know, uh, advisors to local government advisors involved uh, to uh, to try to sort out the issue and those are particularly unique situations we almost never see a situation where all of council is in a position where they conflict, they're in conflict with the code of ethics, um, you know, but, but it can, it can arise. Perfect. Thank you, Derek. Um, our next question, uh, how does the safety of our ratepayers work with COVID-19 guidelines and what can we do to ensure um, the safety in our community? I guess a good uh, a good person to hand this off to Gerald uh, would you maybe want to talk about what you've been doing and all across around uh, COVID-19 safety for residents well obviously we're following the uh, the uh, chief medical officer's uh, advice and uh, coming from the Saskatchewan Health Authority um, the Northwest uh, I noticed there's a uh, Clarence Nottemog and I think is on the line uh, We've had some very, very good discussions and we've actually worked in, in collaboration with uh, all the municip municipalities in Northwest. So it was Northwest Communities uh, uh, Wood Products or Northwest Communities uh, is the one that pulled everybody together and the Incident Command Center was stationed out of Bogal. And uh, there was conference calls daily um, and these went on for about two months. Uh, First Nations, uh, Municipalities, Métis Nation, uh, uh, Medley Tribal Council, and um, local organizations and agencies, regional and otherwise, were involved in those, um, including uh, Chief Medical Officer was on the line and uh, uh, supports from uh, the province. And uh, that communication, I think, uh, was very important and continues to be and uh, letting uh, individuals know in the community or in the region, uh, have an understanding of what's happening. Not only that, but if there's a, a case of COVID in a community, everybody knows their roles and responsibilities and they understand um, um, confidentiality and uh, how to deal with certain situations, but the supports were there. Uh, locally, we uh, actually use our local radio station and uh, uh, provided updates almost on a daily basis and uh, we also use social media uh, from our municipality to uh, ensure that the community me members and residents uh, have a good understanding of what's going on and if there's any uh, uh, situations that need to be dealt with or uh, addressed um, are uh, dealt with uh, accordingly. So uh, there's a number of ways of doing it I guess and uh, make just making sure that uh, you're available and accessible by community members and that you're providing uh, information to the community in a timely manner. I think that's very, very important. And uh, just taking the lead. Uh, just don't wait for somebody to come along. And uh, if there's partnerships that could be formed, then uh, take advantage of that and, and use the resources you have at hand. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Uh, I'm going to bundle some of these questions together because they're um, very similar. So uh, we do have one question here that says, uh, who enforces the General Election Act of 2015? And specifically, 
Uh, who addresses contravention of the act if a counselor or a mayor is in contravention and does that make them ineligible to run? Uh, this is Hassan, and I'd like to answer the questions. Uh, the court uh, enforces uh, the, the act. So if any contravention uh, is noted uh, with regard to a false declaration and something like that, uh, the matter has to be brought uh, before the court. Uh, now, when nomination, uh, nomination uh, officer or uh, any election uh, officials receive uh, um, nomination of papers, uh, for example, and uh, uh, out of the five uh, uh, signatures of nominators, they uh, note that uh, maybe uh, one of them is uh, not a voter of the municipality. It's not uh, the, uh, the uh, election officials' uh, responsibility to point that out. They only need to see whether the nomination uh, papers are completely filled in and signed, uh, signed properly. Uh, and those documents would be posted on the municipality's notice board, and uh, if anybody uh, uh, brings, uh, decides to um, uh, do uh, something about it, uh, that, that matter needs to be brought before the court. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just, just to add to that, if I can, um... Yeah, that's exactly right. Ultimately, it's the courts that will enforce it. And there's, there's two ways that contraventions of the uh, act can be enforced. And one would be by way of uh, what we call a civil action, where somebody brings a challenge under the act, challenging a person, you know, the way they ran the election or their, their eligibility for nomination or what have you. As well, contravention of the act can also rise to prosecution and the imposition of offenses, which would be handled by the ground prosecutors. Um, you would, that would typically happen by way of somebody filing a complaint, uh, it being investigated to the degree that somebody could conclude that there was reasonable and probable grounds to believe that that offense had been committed, resulting in the issuance of, uh, of an information and, and, the ch and charges against the, the individual, uh, in which case it would go before the provincial court as a, as a prosecution. So um, that's typically how uh, the act is enforced. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, and Brad, do you have anything to add or Gerald? Uh, no, that about from my perspective. Perfect. Um, Actually, so I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there was a part of that question that we kind of missed. I think there was a question, is the is a mayor eligible for, uh, for uh, I, I don't see the question here. Or, uh, I don't uh, yeah, see the question here anymore, can... but... Uh, it says, if a current mayor is in direct contravention of the Municipalities Act, are they still eligible to run? Yeah, so I, the short answer there is, uh, in the absence of some determination of ineligibility, uh, they are, a person is entitled to run. So if the suggestion is that uh, the, the mayor is in contravention or any, you know, any elected official is in contravention of the act, um, you know, the really question comes down to is, is the contribution related to something that would disqualify them from office to begin with? In which case, if it is, if it's, if it is something that could potentially disqualify them, the next question is, and has there been a determination made? Because until it's determined that somebody is disqualified from office, they are entitled to run. So you, you have to have some form of determination uh, before the courts typically, uh, or an admission or an admission by the elected official that, for example, that they did say, for example, vote for something that was a conflict of interest and they're no longer um, qualified to be in their, in their position. Uh, so yeah, without the determination that the, uh, there is an actual contravention of the act and that it's the kind of contravention that would put them offside eligibility under the, uh, under the elections act, um, then yes, they would be entitled to run. Perfect. Thank you, Derek. That's a, that's a critical point, Derek. Thanks for, thanks for catching up. Yeah, no worries. Mm -hmm. Uh, our next question is, when bylaws and policies are not followed and the rate payers uh, try and hold the council accountable, um, what can a rate payer do uh, when they don't think that the council is taking action on their complaint? Well, I think we previously um, had mentioned I can take the ombudsman. That would be one place to go. Um, and I'll just keep it very short. Um, you know, when, when, when bylaws and policies aren't being followed and ratepayers are concerned about that, 
uh, you know, complaints can be put forward. Some kinds of issues can give rise to um, um, eligibility challenges of counselors. Some can be just literally uh, challenges before the court saying, well, I think that this bylaw wasn't properly passed. So you might see challenges to a bylaw under the act, for example. Uh, but where there is no specific remedy contem uh, contemplated by the act, the, the remedy is the election. The remedy is vote the people out, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and that's ultimately what we expect to happen in a, in a democracy is if our elected officials aren't following their own bylaws, their own policies, uh, barring some judicial uh, remedy, then the remedy is, a, is in the ballot box. Uh, perfect. And then I guess uh, uh, add that's oh, exactly right. I mean, sorry, uh, ultimately, um, you know, in all cases, we would say it's always best to talk to your council first and try and work it out uh, at a local level. Um, no question. If you go to the ombudsman with a complaint, the first thing they're going to ask you is who you've consulted with. And if you haven't consulted with the municipality, they're going to send you to, to their to that as the first point of contact. Um, so that's the only other, that's the only thing I just want to reinforce is that, um, you know, really, um, addressing these things, um, you know, as, as low to the ground as possible is, um, is tends to be easiest for sure. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. And, uh, I think because it's interesting, I'll flip this question kind of over to the other perspective of, uh, as a counselor, uh, what's the best method of resolving, um, complaints or, or concerns from your residents? So, I'll hand that over to Gerald, and if you just want to speak on kind of uh, some of the ways that you've been able to address concerns of residents and uh, ratepayers in the past. Um, well, people approach me um, on their own uh, rather than uh, bringing it to uh, mayor and council. I tend to uh, try to deal with it by, by, by speaking with uh, the ratepayer or the individual with the concern. Um, I've been invited to uh, individuals' homes uh, to meet with concerned citizens uh, of a block or a certain area of a community. And I've listened to them and then I've heard the, uh, the concerns and I, I take it back to mayor and council to see what we can do to, to help them. Uh, again, I, I do a little bit of my own research to see uh, what resources are available to assist them with some of their grievances or their concerns. Um, I won't get into specifics, but uh, I mean, it's right across the north. Uh, it could be taxation or it could be uh, uh, social issues and challenges we have in our communities. Um, I, I don't think uh, our northern communities are, are very much different from community to community, but uh, we also see some of the major challenges around uh, a lot of social issues and uh, so I, I try to look for resources uh, I try to find uh, uh, something to provide uh, the um, the members of the community with who are coming to me or coming to mayor and council with some concerns so uh, working closely with them being open uh, being available and accessible I think is important um, working for for them and ensuring that uh, we find the, the, the proper resources and, uh, and uh, other avenues of, of dealing with such uh, uh, complaints or issues of concern that come to us. So uh, just be there, have a listening ear and uh, be human. Uh, don't, try to, <laughs> don't try to solve the world's problems and just tell them, uh, you know what, you're, you're gonna give it a try and if not, then let's work together to see what we can do. Perfect. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, our next question is, if the council makes a decision that affects a community, like raising the amount of any payments that are required, um, are they required to send out notice to the community to make them aware of it? Uh, so I guess we'll hand it over to Hassan or Brad. Yeah, like I want to uh, um, uh, answer this uh, question a bit. Uh, so uh, a payment uh, means a lot of different things. Uh, if the council is considering uh, raising their honorary amount, yeah, there's a notice re a public notice re requirement. Otherwise, most of the uh, rates and taxes are uh, changed uh, through a bylaw, and bylaw is given free readings. Uh, so, and uh, the council meetings are open. Uh, 
any resident, anybody, any citizen can go and attend those meetings. Once uh, uh, the, uh, the meeting minutes are approved at the next council meeting, uh, many of the municipalities uh, post their uh, uh, bylaws on their website or uh, um, they also um, uh, provide information that uh, uh, utility rates uh, have changed. So uh, this kind of uh, this process addresses uh, uh, the, the uh, requirement to inform the communities. Uh, if mill rates are uh, changed, uh, in that case, uh, you know every every year uh, uh, property owners uh, get, get tax notices. So uh, that time they become uh, aware of the uh, of uh, the changes in mill rates. Um, also. Um, some uh, information uh, is available in, in the municipalities audit report. So there is way, various ways uh, that the residents uh, and red pairs are informed of uh, council's uh, decision on uh, changes to any payment requirements. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Uh, does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add? No. Oh. Perfect. Um, our next question, and uh, I think this probably also goes to Hassan. It says, um, when are you allowed to start officially campaigning for your election? Um, I'm not aware of any timeline stated in, in the Elections Act. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm aware of that, uh, people uh, who are letting uh, uh, residents know that they would uh, run uh, for uh, mayor's office or uh, council uh, uh, councillor's office, uh, and uh, uh, nomination uh, uh, notice um, for for nomination hasn't been uh, given. So uh, you know the, the, there's no timeline uh, for uh, the for the start of uh, campaigning. Uh, it depends, uh, you know when. Uh, individuals would like to start camp campaigning. Uh, it's up to them. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Uh, our next question is for Gerald. Um, Gerald, it was mentioned when you said uh, uh, when someone uh, when you oppose a motion, you should respect the other councilors if they're in the majority uh, and disagree with you. Um, what do you do when the mo when you believe the motion is completely out of line? Well, again, does the motion serve the best interest of the community? That's what I look at. Um, and of course, if there's implications with budget, has it been budgeted for? Uh, I think it's always uh, in the best interest of any motion, or even if it's out of line, uh, does the person understand actually what they're putting the motion forward for? Um, Again, it's important that uh, council clearly understand that what impacts that motion will have. Um, again, my statement around that earlier was that if I oppose a motion, I still have to respect the motion if the majority passes it. Um, basically, I'm saying I'm not going to leave council chambers and go and cut up the individual who, or individuals who uh, who um, pass the motion. So. Just for um, and ethics and, and uh, uh, respect uh, of council members, uh, that's what you basically do. Uh, it's not personal. It's uh, part of uh, your responsibilities as a councillor. And uh, just work it through, debate it, discuss it. And uh, that's what, when you call a motion to question, that's your opportunity to, to try and sway the, the other council members. That's not in the best interest of the community or it's not in the best interest of, of uh, our budgeting or just the decision-making process we have in place. So I think it's important that uh, you just discuss this and debate it. And if it passes, respect that uh, decision. If not, then you, you've uh, proven your case. So if you want it, it's always good. If you don't, that's good also. So that's a part of dem a democracy. So I think I've answered it. That was my best. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Gerald. Sean, if I can just expand on that a little bit. Yeah, go for think, it. Yeah, I think Gerald's advice is really, really good. I, I can think of a context, though, where um, 
you might want to do a little more. And that's in the very narrow circumstances of where it's not simply that you feel that the motion is, is not the right way to go for your municipality, which is impractical, but where the motion relates to something the council should not be doing, such as unbudgeted items, uh, you know, lending, borrowing, contraventions of, uh, of the act, for example. And so if a councillor has done their best to raise the point that this is outside of our authority, but we don't, you know, we are, have a risk of personal liability, for example, in making that, this decision, or we, we put the municipality at risk if we, if we agree with this contract or what have you. One of the things, in addition to, as, as Gerald has said, raising it in the debate portion on the motion, is call for the recorded vote to at least uh, record officially uh, who voted in favor of a motion that might result in something being offside the act and to show those who voted uh, against it, who did the, the right thing. So uh, it doesn't come up very often, but it, that is one of the reasons that the recorded vote provisions are in the legislation. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. All right, so we have um, about 15 minutes left here, folks. So if you have any last minute questions, uh, you can certainly submit them now. Uh, I do see Clarence has uh, his hand up. So um, Clarence, if you could just confirm in the chat whether uh, you're wanting to speak in person or um, whether you just have your hand up for uh, by accident, let me know. Um, but we can certainly give you uh, speaking privileges if you'd like. And it looks like we have. So I'll go yes. ahead and ask your question. Yeah, just a uh, clarification on one of my questions with regard to el eligibility to vote. Uh, just to confirm, you can still hear me, eh, Sean? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, thank you. So, uh, clarification on, on that question. Um, Section 128 of the Municipalities, Northern Municipalities Act 2010 states that a council member uh, cannot work for a, a municipal corporation. Um, and, I, and I heard the answer. Uh, but specifically, if there is concrete information on a member of council uh, working for a mu uh, municipally owned uh, entity uh, where they're receiving a paycheck from that municipality, um, or not that municipality, but that corporation that's owned by the municipality, uh, does that make him ineligible and I'm talking about black and white information uh, perfect thanks for your question Clarence um, I guess probably the best person to turn this over to would be Derek um, so we'll get you to answer thanks yeah I just want to make sure I just pulled up the section here and I just want to make sure I understand the question uh, and I was trying to both read the section. I went back to it and, and listened to the question at the same time. So maybe Clarence can clarify if I get it wrong. But um, as I understand it, we have somebody who is uh, on council. They are also uh, appointed to the controlled corporation, but they are receiving remuneration in that capacity. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So it's, it is contemplated that that uh, council members who are appointed to a municipal controlled corporation by virtue of the fact that the municipality is entitled to have people on the board of directors uh, and that those people will at least in part be um, maybe uh, appointed from council uh, that remuneration may be may be contemplated uh, for that role so if they're being if they're being um, remunerated for playing a role on the board of directors uh, then that is not something that would be offside section 128 if they're uh, if the role they're playing and being compensated for it gets more into frankly the operational side of the corporation uh, not the management uh, at the board level the policy development uh, side of things then you then you may have a situation where you're offside here it would be very fact specific but uh you know for example i mean a clear you know cut and dry one would be if they have been put in charge of, of a division or they have been uh, given specific mandate to do a, deal with specific operational day-to-day -day, uh, activity of the corporation uh, at a management level. That might be something that goes well outside of what would typically be, uh, be expected of a, a member of council who's been appointed to the board of that controlled corporation. Hopefully that clarifies things. 
Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, Derek, for that uh, insight. Um, if you do have kind of more specific follow-up questions, Clarence, just because it's a, a general candidate session, um, I'll, I'll make sure that we include Derek's contact in the follow-up email, which you'll receive with the recording of this presentation, and uh, uh, you can kind of delve deeper into uh, your questions. Um, I think because we only have 10 minutes left, I'm just going to do a, uh, a quick round table and get everyone's final thoughts on the presentation today. So uh, just if anyone has um, final things to share or uh, specific things that you'd like candidates to keep in mind as uh, they go through the process of running for municipal election and uh, perhaps eventually uh, becoming a member of a municipal council, uh, I'd just be interested to hear uh, what you have uh, to say about that. So. Uh, we'll start with Hassan, and uh, maybe if you just want to share your final thoughts, that would be great. Yeah, I, I just want to add that uh, uh, folks uh, uh, who are uh, planning to run for office, they should uh, keep in mind that, that uh, uh, as a council member, they uh, would be the uh, main job would be serve their community, and. Uh, uh, if not a full-time employment, and uh, uh, there should not be any expectation of um, uh, gainful uh, employment uh, uh, type of uh, remuneration. Uh, 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 they should expect uh, uh, to be paid honoraria as per the council's, uh, uh, as per the municipality's uh, council remuneration bylaw, and serve uh, to the best of their ability to. Uh, move their uh, to develop their uh, community selflessly. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Uh, perfect. Thanks. I guess next we'll hand it over to Derek for your final thoughts. Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would just say that while you know, first of all, I mean, stepping forward and even considering running as a candidate is is an important step, and it's something that most of us don't do. It already takes you in a category of kind of the rare exception in Canadian politics, people who are willing to put their name forward. And so that, that is to be commended right off the bat, whether you're successful or not. Um, the, the thing that I would say is that uh, where we see uh, people who do get elected running into trouble a lot of the time is because they are so focused. And I know this is a re repeat of, of something that uh, Gerald and others have said, where they're so focused on a specific issue that they fail to consider the fact that they are elected for the best to, you know, to see to the best interest of the community as a whole. And it, it, that's not to say if you have particular issues that, that are driving you to run into politics, that that's a bad thing. Um, they just can't be your sole focus when you're on council. And where they tend to be the driving force for a councillor, that's where we see uh, a lot of other challenges arise for that individual and for that council. So, you know, certainly have your pet issues, your pet projects, your pet concerns that you bring forward. And those are the things that people will weigh and decide if they want to elect you or not uh, on the basis of. Uh, but remember that if you do uh, get the honor of sitting in that seat, that your role is to provide for the best interest of the municipality as a whole. And sometimes that will differ from your personal position on an issue. So something to bear in mind. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, we'll move over to Brad. Uh, Brad, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share today? Um, sure. Well, I think we covered uh, a lot of ground here today, that's for sure. And I definitely appreciate the uh, the questions that were raised um, by the folks in the audience. Um, I think they're all really important points. Um, the I guess the only thing I just really want to just touch on is, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, being an elected is, um, um, is a public office. And so there's very high expectations of um, uh, responsibility and transparency in your actions and decisions. Um, a lot of concerns around um, conflict of interest. You know, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of details around um, the legislation. A lot of it does boil down to common sense. Um, it, the, I guess, you know, the, the, a couple of, of uh, things to keep in mind is that, you know, the municipal governments, um, without question are, are the most exciting level of government, I think. And um, so a lot of the issues can tend to get really heated, personal and emotional. Um, but I think, you know, if you're, if you're asking yourself uh, in the context of these decisions and, um, you know, your, your, the decision you're leaning towards, you know, um, 
if if this was um, on the front page of her, if my uh, grandmother were to be aware of the details of this issue, uh, is this a situation or is my decision something that I'd be proud of or embarrassed of? Um, ultimately, if you can satisfy that question for yourself and uh, say that, yeah, you can, you know, you'd, be, you'd face your grandma, you'd face the newspaper, um, then, um, then you, you really have no, um, no qualms. Um, at the end of the day, if there's any concerns, then there's probably other issues that are underlying that. There's more investigation you need to do, whether that's research or just even internally in yourself. Um, at the end of the day, the um, um, yeah, transparency and responsibility are, are absolutely two of the most critical aspects of, uh, of uh, serving public office. And if you're doing your job um, and being as transparent and responsible manner as you can imagine, it's pretty tough to think that anyone else is going to be thinking differently. So just if you keep those things in mind, um, I think you'll be uh, on the right track. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Brad. And I, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, it, can it pass a headline test? What's what's the worst thing someone could write about the decision you've made? And uh, would it still be an acceptable thing? So uh, last but not least, we'll, we'll have Gerald share his final thoughts and uh, any suggestions he has for our up and coming counselors. Um, be prepared to, uh, to question yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You can be painted into a corner very quickly when it comes to municipal council and having to uh, to answer to uh, ratepayers and their community members. And uh, it can be challenging at times. Uh, sometimes it's best to take a step back, reassess uh, what it is you want to say. But not always. It's not always uh, very easy to uh, provide answers. But then if you can't, don't try to wing it. Uh, just say, "Look, I'll get back to you uh, with an answer." If I can't, then I'll find, try, I'll work, try and find resources and I'll work with our administration and whatnot to, to deal with some of the concerns. Um, public office is not an easy task uh, if you're going to go into it. Um, do some research, uh, be, be prepared, and uh, it's never easy. Uh, I take it as a grain of salt and uh, don't try to solve the world's problems. It, it's, it won't work. Uh, you have a team you have to work with. Uh, again, uh, the words I said earlier, like uh, respect, trust, honesty, accountability, transparency, uh, confidentiality, responsibility. That all comes with it. Uh, be prepared to, uh, to do some work, do some research. And prepare for meetings. Get a basic understanding of budgeting. That's probably the best advice I can give. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, well, I want to thank all of our presenters today. Um, the information you presented on is really useful and uh, we hope that it provides kind of a basis for uh, our candidates as they move forward and potentially into new roles as uh, municipal councillors and or mayors. So uh, thank you all for attending today and thank you all for your great questions. Uh, we will be providing you a recording of this presentation to all the registrants as well as a PDF of today's PowerPoint. And if you know anyone that's running for municipal election uh, that should have seen this presentation or should have been here today, uh, we'll make sure that this uh, video of this presentation is publicly available and easy to find so you can send it to them. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill out this short survey so we can improve our upcoming events and uh, learn how to improve this session because we have another one coming up September 1st for the general election. Uh, I just want to give one last huge thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, I wish everyone a great uh, rest of your day and uh, good luck in your elections. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure once again to participate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sean.